This is the Exam Room Podcast brought to you by the Physicians Committee. Hi, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. Today, we are going to be talking about monkeypox. Here we are still in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, and along comes another infectious disease making all kinds of headlines. So today, we're going to be introducing you to what monkeypox is and what we know about it so far. And helping us in this roundtable discussion today is the author of Your Body in Balance. He is also the president and founder of the Physicians Committee. Dr. Neil Barnard is here and also also joining us is an infectious disease expert who happens to be our director of medical education at the Physicians Committee. She is also the former chief of infectious diseases at the VA in Hudson Valley, New York. With that, we welcome Dr. Sarai Stancic as well as Dr. Neil Barnard to the exam room. Thank you both so very much for being here. Good to see you, Chuck. Good to see you, Chuck. Thank you so much for inviting us to speak on this important topic. It is an important topic, and it seems like no matter where you turn right now, you're seeing headlines, Dr. Stancic, about monkeypox. And I think that before we begin our discussion about what it really is, let's talk about where it has come from. What do we know about the origins right now of monkeypox? Right. Well, we know a bit. Um, it was first described in 1958 uh, in uh, monkeys, ill monkeys that had been imported from Singapore to Denmark to a research facility. So that was the first recognition of the virus. But it wasn't until 12 years later in 1970 where we saw the first case in a nine-year-old boy in Central Africa. Now, since that uh, diagnosis back in 1970, we've seen sporadic cases, and, and this is a, uh, an infection that is endemic to Western and Central Africa. Um, it wasn't until 2003 where we had a large outbreak here in the United States, and we can talk a little bit more about that. But before I do that, I just want to explain what monkey pox is. It is a relative of smallpox, which you're probably very familiar with. Fortunately, it's less contagious and less deadly than smallpox. Now, smallpox um, is has was eradicated uh, from the globe in 1980 when the World Health Organization um, uh, called this eradication, which was an extraordinary moment in our history because it is the only human infectious diseases which we've been able to arrive at that designation. Uh, now, the monkeypox. Um, outbreak, as I described earlier, the one that occurred in 2003, occurred in the Midwest United States when some uh, rodents were imported into uh, into the Illinois area, and then they were cohabitants with prairie dogs that then were sold as pets. In that outbreak, we had about 50 individuals that were infected with the virus. There were no deaths, but it was limited. We now have had um, in, in this current outbreak, about a thousand uh, individuals that have been infected over 29 countries. And in the United States, we have about 12 states currently that have at least one case. Okay. So I, I hear those numbers and um, they really do pale in comparison to the numbers we're seeing with the COVID-19 pandemic, what we've seen over the past almost three years now. Um, given that, Dr. Stanzik, how concerned should we be right now about monkeypox? I think we need to be aware and we need to be following this very, very carefully. I think concern, um, uh, it, we should have some, but I, I don't think it's, uh, we don't believe at this point that this is something that will elevate to the level of pandemic. I think it's important for us to understand how this virus is transmitted, what we can do to prevent and we do have, unlike COVID-19, this is a virus that we're, we're familiar with, that we understand. Again, it's been around since 1958. We have a vaccine available to us. We have immunoglobulin. We have antivirals to use in these settings. Fortunately, as I said previously, we have not had deaths. We, it doesn't appear that we have severe disease. It, it is primarily self-limited and patients are, are doing relatively well. But it's important for us to be aware so that when we see cases that we can isolate them and manage them appropriately and reduce risk of transmission. Dr. Barnard, I, I wanna come to you now because here we have an instance where uh, we have a virus that originated in an animal and it jumped to a human being. And then more recently with COVID-19, that's exactly how the pandemic began. Began very likely in a wet market in China, wild animals being exposed, being kept in very close quarters to each other, but then humans coming into contact with them, lo and behold, what happens? The virus jumps from animal to human. 
it seems to me like now we have this this case again here with the monkeypox, and this is going to continue to happen. So can you talk to us about kind of the dangers of, of what's happening as far as these viruses being able to jump from these wild animals to humans, and then we just see them spread like wildfire? This has been a theme that we have seen uh, over and over and over again, and public health experts are always warning that you don't want to be having contact with wild animals. You don't want to bring them into your markets or your grocery stores or, for, for that matter, your laboratories or your pet stores or that kind of thing for exactly the reason that you gave, Chuck, is that they carry their own kind, their own viruses. And normally, humans and these animals wouldn't interact at all. Uh, but as Dr. Stancic was saying, okay, you bring home a cute pet prairie dog, which people would normally not have in their, their home. And if the animals are then carrying in viruses, they can leap across the species um, divide. Where this was really uh, dramatically observed was in 1918, uh, the H1N1 so-called Spanish flu uh, killed, what, 50 million people. And this flu is uh, from a virus, a virus that's in wild birds. And so the wild birds can park in your flock of ducks or chickens or whomever. The wild birds can transmit the virus to them, and then they transmit it to the people keeping the birds and then to their uh, family and their social contacts and so forth. And, and that was a, a particularly deadly pandemic. Uh, much deadlier than, than COVID-19 uh, because it was totally novel. It was uh, something to which humans really didn't have any you know, immunity at all. But Chuck, it, it gets worse than this. It's not just that the animals introduce new viruses to us, but once the influenza virus was introduced into human beings, it never left. Um, so we've had influenza ever since, but then new strains come in because a new bird virus uh, in 1957, again in 1968, new bird viruses then came and mingled their, their DNA with the existing viruses, and suddenly you've got a totally immunologically new virus that the human immune system can't really deal with, and then you see a lot more deaths. And it's kind of what we're seeing now with COVID-19, where you have the mutating viruses uh, constantly and challenging our immune system. The moral of the story is we've seen this over and over and over again. In 2015, the CDC went into a Minnesota uh, market, basically. They looked at, at live pigs that were being sold, and they found that 86% of them had influenza viruses, and they could, could pass them to human beings. We see it over and over and over again. Uh, note to self, leave the animals alone. Okay, so let, let me let's let's digest this. I don't think that this is something that the typical person who would be shopping in in a market such as that with all of these live pigs is really kind of cognizant of, and that is that yeah, the animal that they're there interacting with can pass the virus right on to them, and it seems like this is well, it doesn't seem like it is a fact now that that is another instance of that. So I mean. It, it seems like it would be really simple just to say, Dr. Barnard, well, let's, you know, shut down all of these markets. Let's end all of these these laboratory tests. But like, what are some actionable steps do you think somebody can take right now who's watching this, who's hearing this podcast? What's something that they can do to say, hey, you know, we really got to make some differences and move the needle in, in a healthier direction here? Um, there, there are steps we could take. But first, I should say it's actually a two way street, uh, because when the coronaviruses came in, as you said, it was a bat virus. And whether people believe it came from a wet market or came from a laboratory, in either case, they were using bats um, and the bat virus leapt into human beings. But once the COVID-19 virus, the SARS-CoV-2 virus was in human beings, humans could then pass it back to animals. And you might remember November 2020 um, in Scandinavia, mink farms started to show the mink had COVID-19, the, the COVID-19 virus. Where did they get it? They got it from people. And so it goes back across the species divide. It will then mutate further. And the, the more humans and wild animals interact, the more you get this cauldron effect of viruses that can change. But you asked about um, actionable steps. Um, to tell you the truth, I wish that our governments had the courage to do what they need to do. There are live animal markets now that have chickens, ducks, other animals kept alive um, these are perfect viral vectors 
Um, and as, in fact, as soon as, as COVID-19 emerged, Tony Fauci said, one of the things we really need to do is close down those live markets. They're still operating. Um, there's many, many of them in New York, and you and I have talked about that before. Um, those need to close down. It helps, obviously, if people don't uh, frequent those places, if, they, if, they don't, uh, if they're not customers of those places. Animals should not be used in laboratories, obviously, for many reasons we've discussed. But it's a terribly dangerous thing to bring in um, wild monkeys or, or uh, other animals and have them at close quarters with your lab techs and, and other people. Um, wild animals do not make suitable companions. Uh, so we shouldn't be bringing them in our homes in that way. Um, and people think of a mink coat as, as if it comes from um, a store. Well, it came from live animals, and that's where we see these, these kinds of interactions there. So the theme is leave the animals alone. And then the related theme is that when people have gotten COVID-19, they inhale it, which can happen despite the best of precautions. Those people who have been avoiding eating animals actually have the best immunity, as we've discussed as well. So um, th this theme does come up over and over again about leaving the animals alone. Yeah, Dr. Stancic, that's a great transition over to you for this next question. And that is very early on in the COVID pandemic, we heard about the healthier the person is, the less likely they are to become severely ill. And even speaking with Dr. Uh, Andrew Chan from Harvard yesterday, he and I were talking about a study that uh, he co-authored of more than 600,000 people that looked at the quality of the diet and the natural immunity a person had to COVID-19. And just as Dr. Barnard said, the healthier that person was, um, the more they gravitated toward a plant-based diet, the more immunity they seem to have. Obviously, we're very early on in this latest outbreak of monkeypox, but what do we know in terms of, you know, uh, how many comorbidities a person may have and their risk of becoming ill with monkeypox? Yeah, that's a great question, Chuck. We don't know, we don't have that much information. We do know that children tend to have more severe disease, and those that are considered immunocompromised are also more more likely to have um, more significant severe disease. And let me ask you the the numbers that we have today, as we record this, hovering right around one thousand cases or so. Yes. Um, the incubation period is what I, I believe it's up to two weeks. Is that accurate? It can be as short as five and as long as 21 days. On average, it's seven to 14 days. And so during that period, uh, the patient is asymptomatic. Then when symptoms occur, they typically begin with high fever, chills, muscle aches, so like a flu-like illness. And patients develop adenopathy, so swollen lymph nodes. About two to three days after that prodromal period, patients will develop the rash. And it's really interesting because the rash sort of um, goes through stages. At first, it's what we call macules, so just flat lesions, and then papules, which are raised lesions. And then it evolves into vesicular, so you know, fluid-filled vesicles. And then finally, the last stage is pustular, where you have essentially yellow or pustular pus-like fluid within the vesicle, and then there's crusting. Now, it's important to note that during that entire period, the patient is highly infectious, so they should be isolated during that time. Infectivity ends once the lesion is crusted and, and new skin grows over that. Until that time, the patient should be isolated. And and remind us again, how long does that that once a person starts experiencing symptoms, I mean, does that take a week to run its course, two weeks, a month? Do we know how long that is? Or it's does about it two to four weeks, about okay. two to four weeks. That seems like a, a pretty rough uh, half of a month or, or, or full month for the patient. I, I would think that, yes. you know, it's hard enough to isolate with COVID-19, but then if you're dealing with all of these other things you were just describing as far as the symptoms that present with this, uh, that would be really, really difficult for one person to manage. And so, I mean, you're going to want to basically, I would think, do whatever it is in, in your power to make sure that that does not come into your household. Absolutely. And the most important thing we can do to prevent the infection is to avoid infected animals, for sure, and then identify as early as possible anyone who's been exposed to monkeypox to ensure that we isolate, that we vaccinate. Uh, because again, if we vaccinate within four days of the exposure, you can prevent the disease from occurring. And even if you vaccinate later 
up to 14 days into the exposure, you could at least prevent severe disease. Dr. Stancic, initially with the HIV AIDS epidemic in the 1980s, it was initially believed to be a disease that was passed exclusively among the gay community. Obviously, that proved to be 100% incorrect. But in the case of monkeypox, we're also beginning to see clusters of cases among gay men. Is it safe to say that this too is not a disease that is exclusive to the gay community? Uh, in the media, uh, information that tells us that there have been a cluster, as you pointed out, in men who have sex with men. This is not a sexually transmitted disease, uh, as the way we understand it. This is a disease that uh, is spread through close contact. So it may be that there there is a setting or an example here where there were where there was transmission. Um, in, in this community, but everyone is equally susceptible. If you're in contact with someone, it has nothing to do with um, being homosexual or that it's a sexually transmitted disease. This is a close contact um, transmission and everyone is equally susceptible. And Dr. Barnard, final question goes to you. We've kind of, you know, gathered this answer in drips and drabs throughout the course of the conversation, but I'd like to ask you directly, in terms of the benefit of eating a plant-based diet here, what would those benefits be in terms of mitigating somebody's risk for monkeypox? Well, what we've seen over and over again um, with a wide variety of conditions, not just COVID-19, we also have seen it with influenza and even response to uh, the influenza vaccine is the cleaner your diet, the more your diet is plant-based, the better off you're gonna be. When I say better off, I mean that if you get infected, um, your course is likely to be much more benign or even asymptomatic. Um, when people are on diets that are very high in animal products, they tend to do much worse. Um, and obviously the sequelae of a bad diet, obesity, that makes the infections worse. Um, and also it makes vaccines less effective hypertension, uh, diabetes, all the things that come from a really bad diet, they make the susceptibility to a severe case uh, much, much higher, unfortunately. Um, and, and I wanna underscore something that, that Dr. Stancic was saying earlier. You know, there have been no deaths so far, but let's be clear, monkeypox is not a picnic. Um, it's a really rough disease to have. And right now it's very much in the early stages. We all have our headlights on looking to see where is this gonna go? And for now, we just don't know. It's very early stages. Hopefully it'll be contained. Uh, people who develop it, as Dr. Sansic says, can get treatment and they're gonna survive. Uh, but it's, we're all just waiting to see where this disease process goes. Any final thoughts, Dr. Stancic? No, I fully agree. I think right now uh, it's premature to, to and, and it's important for us to, to keep our headlights on and, and, and watch this as it, as it evolves. But just as we do um, with COVID-19 recommendations, practicing good infection control measures like hand washing um, are incredibly important now, uh, just as they were previously. Yeah. Dr. Barnard, Dr. Stancic, thank you both very much for joining us today. Thank, thank you, Chuck. If your health IQ is a couple of points higher than it was a few minutes ago, go ahead and like this video or subscribe to the YouTube channel. And to take it even higher, head over to Apple Podcast or wherever you get your favorite shows. Look for the exam room by the Physicians Committee. Hit the subscribe button there as well and help to make your world a healthier place.